Hello, folks. My name is Norman Woodstock Spalding. We're going to do a bare bones broadcast tonight. I woke up in the middle of the night with an understanding, and I want to record it best I can. The understanding is about this word truth. Let's see if I can get this out. The truth is a conceptional picture of living, of E-A-R, parentheses, T-H, the planet Earth, and human living. The truth takes on the subjects and aspects and experiences of living. Within itself, the truth, it's a aspect of of a conceptional witness. It's the accurate description of a sequence of events that leads up to any experience or event you're wanting to describe. And it includes those, whatever you're describing, only it also includes more the events and background and scene of the experience you're wanting to describe as much as anything you're wanting to describe. Because anything you describe is involved in a bigger scene called living and mammal and earth and or whatever it is, insect or whatever aspect of earth you're speaking about. The truth incorporates that about this planet or about this cosmos or anything else you're wondering about if there is such an animal outside the cosmos that you have the ability to wonder about, which I don't if you do. When the cosmos is full of so many experiences and aspects that your senses don't even incorporate, I wouldn't go outside of it. Even though I do, I speak to myself about a creator that I have no possible way of knowing. If you couldn't understand everything about the cosmos, it still doesn't mean you have the evidence of what built it at all. You might have a few aspects of possibly understanding some patterns of this thing's reasoning. It's quite alien to whatever it builds, and whatever it builds is like a miniature little paperweight sitting on its desk for a charm, uh, for its own charm, more than anything else I can figure. That would be the only function this thing does. It's very busy work, that's for sure, and only does deliver charm and curiosity and things like that. It's all it's for. It's a charming experience creation is, even though it has eat and get eaten in it, which I find asinine. And that's a conceptional viewpoint again. And here's one thing about the truth that must be remembered, is that it has a sense of humor usually associated with it, because, at least with humans, nothing else laughs at the truth except humans do, because they find a lot of satire to it. They don't believe it is even possible. And when you tell them the truth, they will break into laughter because they find it delightful that they even got near it. It's not even possible that they could understand the truth. A man from Africa the other day told me, no one knows the truth. Now, he used the word knows. But humans can understand the truth knowing it is a different thing. They can understand the truth is, and they can understand that there's a point of witness called conception called truth, only to find it is tricky. And when they even get near it, they will break into laughter. And it, it's a sense of humor goes with the truth, and it beats justice, because when humor and truth are around, you normally are uh, far from breaking laws. You're living way above the law, and you're keeping mutual and morality, and the law is quite uh, accusational compared to that, and has little or no backing or reasoning in it is done by uh, human beings that are up to something quite different than causing a lovely effect, any law. So law isn't really a point of, let's say, morality at all. It's usually an intrusion trying to cause trouble more than it is anything to do with morality. So when you want to live morality, you live far above the law and don't even refer to the law at all. It's the last place you go and, and the last resort. And seldom does deliver the morality you're looking for. It's like grudge or vengeance or something like that. It's not a very practical tool to regulate living with law. You live far above that. You live in glee and humor and things like that and aspects of living of joy and, and contribution and 
and uh, duty and places like that, and you have a lot of more fun. And the people that are struggling with their stingy, fool with law and places like that, and they have little sense of humor. Usually when you live in the concept of the truth, uh, you live in curiosity and you live with your tongue in your cheek. Uh, you realize that in most cases, especially when it comes to um, being able to judge anyone, you're a hypocrite at that and you don't. And you don't get your nose like Pocono in everybody else's business and you keep yourself quite honest with things with yourself. And just all kinds of things like that. And the truth has a great sense of humor with it. And it's it's very high and above any uh, so-called justice or grudge or getting even or making sure that your position is guarded and you're not taken advantage of. Or the truth uh, doesn't consider or worry about things like that. It doesn't. It's far above that. And the motive is even if they are taking advantage, that's something you want to do by duty anyway. So they're not getting the best of you at all. You're already way ahead of their uh, conniving to uh, sneak you into some position to help them. You're already there. So it's not like you're not wanting to be used. You're very usable for everybody's welfare. And don't find that a problem at all. That's your job. You want to link everyone together and get everyone at a convenient and frequent position to uh, explanation and the inside story and everyone included. Very much. Your motive is, is very full of um, a sentiment for everyone. Does that make any sense? I hope it does. It's a position of conception, the truth. And you have to drink it like blood and eat it like flesh. That's what Christ was talking about. He talked about himself being the embodiment of a practice, a lifestyle of a mammal, a class of living called the truth. And he had a great sense of humor with him. Jonah was about the same thing. I realized that's what Jonah did with Nineveh. He got them laughing at themselves, and they sat down, and he did his job. And as much as he reminded them of their detriment and their uh, em obvious uh, eventual ruin, uh, he reminded them with a sense of humor that they're human and priceless and adorable and something they had forgotten. And... It, something that you remember in creation, it's part of creation, and Jonah was very much a creationist and, and followed the dictates of anyone that would understand creation. You have a certain satire with its maker. And the only reason he got mad was he knew that there was more coming than that, and there was a lot more to be said than what was being said. It's more like an article of a uh, a writer having an argument with himself, this 800 B.C. article of Jonah, is a priceless piece of literature. And it's full of conceptual and acronym, and it's a wonderful, wonderful article to challenge you to like the book of Job or better. It, it has a far more, um, oh, I think practical cut into living when you picture Nineveh and what happened than the book of Job, even though the book of Job is very specific and precise and that your best friends are your worst enemies and make Lucifer nothing. That's for sure. And that you will suffer, mainly because of how your rumors and your reputation is, is cast among others, as much as any disease or problem you have with yourself. And however those they view you is pretty much the way they treat you, and you're locked into that somewhat. No matter how you do yourself, you're still caught in the framework of how people see you. And it's, well, it's, it's able to move through that, only it's like a, um, it's like a force field to your progress, that's for sure. And you, you only want to, when they're really, when they don't have the brains to witness you worth a hoof, Christ said, get out of there. Take up the three times to speak with them, oh, I gotta get this mount of the 